and I will call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of February 7th. Uh, we have one to agenda item relating to the QHP plans, and uh, we'll have a vote hopefully on that. Um, but first, we'll turn to the executive director for um, the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A few scheduling announcements. Uh, first, wanted to let the remind the board and let the public know that on Monday, February 12th at 2 p.m., we have a general advisory meeting, and then and that's via Teams. And then um, please check our website for our February uh, schedule with our regularly scheduled board meetings. I also want to remind the on two ongoing public comment periods we have. We continue to accept any public comments on Act 167 hospital sustainability work um, and you know any of the comments re related to the community engagement work we recently did and any comments in general related to that uh, work on Act 167. And then in addition, we have the ongoing public comment period uh, for a next potential all-payer model. Um, we share any of those comments with Agency of Human Service and the administration as they are meeting the negotiations on it. And that, I will turn back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and we have uh, board minutes from Wednesday, January 31st. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. All those in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Uh, sorry, we're having a hard time hearing you. I can probably guess what you're going to say, uh, which is you're going to abstain because you not, did not participate in that hearing. So we will note that Dr. Merman is abstaining from voting and four members have approved the minutes. Um, so the minutes are approved and we'll move to the 2025 standard qualified health plan design um, proposal and a potential vote. Um, I'll turn to Mr. Houlihan in the event you have any additional information for the board. Thanks um, for inviting us back today. We are here in follow up to our presentation of the uh, proposed plan designs for 2025. Um, I'm Dana Houlihan from the Department of Vermont Health Access, and I'm joined by Darren Johnson and Julie Pepper of Wakely Consulting, our um, our, our um, actuaries helping us through this process. So in follow up to last week's meeting, uh, we had a request from the board to insert the 2024 premium amounts um, with each of the seven plan designs for as a point of reference and also to um, provide more information on the drivers of of costs. And so in doing that, we'll, uh, Wakely has prepared some information and we'll also review uh, the some of the factors changing for 2025, which were fairly significant that impact the um, actuarial value calculator and other rules of the road for 2025. So uh, Darren, if you're prepared, I'll go ahead and turn that to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Dana. Yeah, so just uh, a couple of slides go, kind of reviewing some of the stuff we discussed last week, and then we'll we'll provide some more context for the premium impacts. Um, you know, last week we kind of went through all these changes and then went through all the plan designs. And in some ways, I think it's nice to go through the plan designs and then you know, after we've done that, say, okay, this is how those changes kind of impacted, impacted the designs that we looked at. So as a reminder, the two kind of big things um, that changed from 24 to 25 is that one, the maximum out-of-pocket limit decreased from 94.50 to 92.00. Um, so there were several plan designs that had maximum out-of-pockets above that limit, and those have to be reduced to 92.00, which is a benefit increase. Um, and that's the first time that's ever happened that that limit has gone down from one year to the following year. And then the other big change was the ABC updates. Um, they changed the source of the data from 2018 
mostly group data to 2021 edge data. The combination of that with some other methodological changes meant that silver and bronze ABC, ABs especially, were reduced. Whereas again, typically year over year, we would see ABs only increase as the underlying data for the AB calculator is updated by um, HHS. So that was a big difference than what we usually see in the past um, and changed kind of the landscape of what we were what we were dealing with compared to prior years. Um, and then as always, our, our typical note on premium impact, when we're looking at the, both as a stakeholder group and then in this presentation, when we're looking at premium impact, it helps to have, you know, trading off one plan design versus another, it helps to have some sort of estimate of what the premium impact of these different results are. Um, so we use our own Wakely pricing AV calculator to assign an actuarial value to these plans um, to compare to the previous year's plan designs um, to give us kind of that, that data point. And then a change this year is that instead of just showing a percentage premium impact, we include it a estimated dollar premium impact using the 2024 premiums. So I'll just hop to a, a slide to show that. Um, so for example, on the platinum plan in the past, we had just showed our preferred option is a 0.2% impact. Our backup option is a 0.4% impact. Um, this year we took the 2024 premiums, which we have added to the slides um, kind of per your feedback. And then we can take that 0.2% and say, okay, that's a $30 impact annually. You know, this one's a $56 impact annually um, and kind of added that data point. Um, as always, we, we caveat that premium impact pretty heavily. This is run on our model, it's national data. Um, we try to calibrate it to Vermont experience, um, but the issuer specific models will certainly be different, certainly be much more calibrated to Vermont experience um, and will likely have, have different results. Um, and then the, the other kind of point of note there is that the 24 plan design is kind of our baseline for premium impact. We run on 24 projected costs. And then when we're running our 25 plan designs, um, we're running on kind of projected 25 costs based on typical Vermont trends. Um, and I'll have a, a spreadsheet I'll pull up in a second to, to illustrate that a little more. Um, but these premium impacts are not solely due to our plan design changes, even if this year there is certainly more on that side than typical because of kind of those ABC and, and MOOP um, out-of-pocket max change factors that I mentioned. Um, but a lot of it is due to the benefit leveraging where if costs increase, the value of a given deductible or out-of-pocket max level increases as well. So, you know, the silver plan has a 2.2% you know, premium impact, which is high and certainly higher than we typically see. Part of that component is that this plan has significant benefit increases over the previous years with copays being cut and the deductible and out-of-pocket max on the medical side decreasing. Another part of that is we're just assuming if costs increase at typical levels for Vermont, the value of this plan design increases due to that. Um, so that was the piece we wanted to add. Um, as a note, as you're, you're going through these slides, the other kind of work with this year is because the out-of-pocket limit decreased, $250, any plan design that did not have a commissurate decreased was flagged as green and requiring formal approval. Um, so even you know, this platinum plan where this backup option, we don't touch the out-of-pocket max at all, that requires explicit appro formal approval this year um, because of the, the federal one decreasing by so much. So even a plan like this, where we actually on the silver deductible decrease our out-of-pocket max a little bit, we're not decreasing it $250, so it gets flagged as green. Um, so I, I included all those slides just to have the premiums there um, to be able to look at. Probably the one other interesting point um, as you look through the issuer premiums is that they sometimes, you know, flip-flop on some of the, the bronze plans and, you know, the HDHPs as which one thinks which plan is, is richer than another plan. Um, just to kind of illustrate the point that their own internal models are going to differ from the way that we model um, just due to having different data and being more Vermont specific. On the cost point, we compiled just a, a few a few little tables. Um, so this top table is our estimated premium impacts over the last three years we've been doing this, um, which helps kind of illustrate that this year is atypical. 
Um, so in 2023, the typical premium impact was around 0.6%. 24, it was around 1%. This year, it's 1.5%. Um, so the one takeaway is that that's going up due to the ABC changes. Um, we left plan designs the same or increased benefits, whereas in a typical year, we have to decrease benefits just to remain in compliance. Um, the other key point is that that's not, you know, to the point I think raised last week, this isn't a huge component of the overall rate increase that typically occurs. Um, you know, the second table we have, you know, the last few years, what have trends look like? Um, so 2022 to 2023, the average trend was about 11% with most of that on the unit cost side in 23 to 24 um, trends dropped. Average projected trend, um, this is from the URRT public files from the last, um, last year's filings um, was about 7%. So, you know, our our portion of what we're adjusting with these plan designs, you know, can be meaningful. 1.6 is you know, an additional percent over 0.6, but it's only a piece of the of the whole puzzle. Um, and then the other note was just pulling the average individual market rate increases the last few years. Um, you know, obviously these are, you know, there's a lot more going into this than just our, the premium impact. Um, and even just trend, though trend is going to be obviously a big component of it there can be financial considerations you know regulatory changes um and other factors that go into those beyond what, what we're kind of controlling here with these standard plant designs um but just wanted to kind of include those as well as a little bit of extra extra information on on kind of drivers of of cost let me go to my pdf um so yeah then the overall all summary of what we've changed um again we reviewed all this last week um but this is it's kind of the, the summary of the changes from, from last year to this year. Dana, did that, that cover it? Anything else that I missed? Uh, yes, I think so. I think I um, just want to underscore the point when you say that benefits are increasing, that means cost share decreases. I, I think that's yes. probably goes with, <laughs> it goes without saying, but um, that's what would drive premium up is by making a benefit richer. So it's um, decreasing cost share, increasing the yes. benefit as, as um, Darren was saying. Yeah, in the case of like the silver plan, we are decreasing the out-of-pocket max, which is increasing the benefit, which is decreasing cost share, which will increase premiums. Um, right, yeah, that's <laughs> clear as mud. A lot, of, a lot of this is to say, as Darren pointed out, that this is an unusual year where we're in that position with um, actually decreasing cost share with the ability to, to, to decrease cost share in, in some of the plans um, as a way of bringing the AV to a level that we as a stakeholder group felt great about. So again, it's just unusual. And as always, we're trying to, by doing these measured strategic changes, our hope is to avoid uh, big swings and changes required next year because um, this transition of the data and other factors are not expected to be as significant next year, although we never know until we're given the rules. <laughs> Yeah, last year was also kind of a strange model with some methodological tweaks that gave us some room on some plans, and I didn't expect it to continue this year, and obviously it did, so you never know. But I would expect next year to be a much more standard standard update of the ABC model. If you don't have anything else, I'll open up to board member questions, if, unless there's something else you wanted to share. I think that's all we have for in terms of presentation. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate you guys giving the additional information um, that the board had asked for. Are there any other questions from the board members or comments? Anything from, well, actually, I'll go ahead and make a motion and then I'll ask the help. Oh, I think Tom out. was trying to say. Oh, go ahead, Tom. So thanks, I was muted. Um, thanks for the additional information. 
Um, a question on the premiums that, that you um, showed the boxes with those. Um, it, that's per month, right? Sorry. Yes, that is that is a per member per month premium for an individual contract. So, right, individual level only. The uh, one pager that I uh, distributed last week would contain. I mean, it's it's I know tiny print, but it has um, individual, couple, adult and child, and family tiers as well. So, but what's in this box is just the um, individual level premium as the point of reference. Thank you, Dana. And um, I think it's really useful information just um, for all of us on the board to keep in mind um, how expensive these are. Right on the low end, um, $750 times 12, you know, we're closing in on $9,000 just in premium, right, for the bronze. And um, somewhere north of 15,000, I think, for the platinum. Um, and the, the silver somewhere in between those, but with very large deductibles. All right, so it's somewhere around 10,000 to get into the game to then be able to pay the deductible. Um, so these are big numbers, and I think it this the added information helps me keep that in mind. Um, and the Excel spreadsheet that you showed, Darren, um, if I'm following that correctly, um, the unit cost is another way for us to be able to think about that is the price increase, right? What providers are charging and their util and the utilization are the two things that can um, drive up what um, insurers or payers have to reimburse on. And it, Quick math here, 8.8 .8 divided by 11%. It looks like 80% of the change is driven by rising prices in 22 to 23. Um, five divided by seven, somewhere in the order of 70% um, of the change in 23 to 24, driven by rising prices. So utilization is a small matter in Vermont where we have an access problem and a healthy population. Um, rising prices are what is driving the rising premiums, if I'm interpreting this data correctly. Yeah, and I would, I think that's definitely generally correct. I do want to add my actuarial caveats. Um, Please. <laughs> that I, I only pulled two years of data because the market was unmerged in 22, so I felt like including data before that you know, was was not necessarily as representative, which also means I'm including, you know, two years of trend and high inflation years with high rate increases that are not necessarily, you know, fully representative of the Vermont market, but it felt like the best context to give. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the premium impact side, the one, you know, one thing we we're hoping in increasing benefits, um, knowing that that results in a higher premium impact is that hopefully subsidies will increase, you know, correspondingly. Obviously, I think somebody raised the point last year, those subsidies are still funded by tax dollars, including Vermont tax dollars, but that was kind of part of our part of our thinking as well. Great, Thank, thanks so much. The other thing that, um, to be honest, was a surprise to me when I became a board member, um, subsidies are useful for helping with premiums. If I understand correctly, they don't help with deductibles or co-pays. Yeah, we do have on that side of it, if you are under, we keep this in the appendix, um, if you are under 250% of the FBL, you do get the silver CSR plans that do have lower deductibles. So that's where there is, you know, some measure of assistance. But yeah, over that 250% FPL level, it is only oh. only premium. Yeah, assistance. in Vermont. Actually, in Vermont, it's up to 300. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, Thank you, sorry. Okay. Richard. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks so much for the added information and the added context. I really appreciate you. Um, and at, at this point in time, on the individual market, we have over 90% of the people enrolled in the individual market receive some level of subsidy. Thank you. Okay.
Can I just ask, ask a quick follow-up question to that? Uh, Darren, when you look at that data that you pulled on the uh, Excel spreadsheet that you had up, is there any way, one thing that I hear as a driver of high insurance costs in Vermont is that we have a an older, sicker population of people who are getting uh, insurance on the commercial markets. Um, I guess just wondering if, if, if looking at all the various states that you look at, if that's something you can derive from the information that you see. And, and two, when you look at this um, average annual market allowed claim trends, where would that show up? Would that show up in the cost or the utilization if we were concentrate, if the market was concentrating into a sicker population? So it'll be a bit of both um, in that, you know, an older population will use more and as they age more, probably continue to use more um, and use a higher cost mix of services. But I should say it's it's more going to be the base allowed level and the trend is going to be more cost increases. Um, so like this unit cost trend, your population is your population. Um, and that's going to more reflect the prices being charged for the same services rather than the the aging of the population. I would say from what I've seen, um, Vermont does seem to be higher cost um, than a lot of states. I like kind of know Julie's Julie's popping in here who has even more experience with the Vermont market. Um, but that that does impact some of the the AVs we calculate on sort of the pricing side. And Julie, I'll let you let you hop in here. Yeah, I can I can I'll speak a little bit to the first question, which um, you know, I think Vermont. I think generally people always say the Vermont premiums are higher than other states, but I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's community rated, so it's not age rated, so it appears higher. Um, so a few years ago, I think it's out there somewhere, I could find it if needed. We did, a, Wakely did an analysis for the state of Vermont. I think it might have been as part of the analysis on the unmerging of the markets, but looking at Vermont premiums compared to other states and when you uh, you know, Vermont is does have a slightly higher age than the, the national average. And so when you actually account for that in the premiums, Vermont premiums are actually um, lower, I think, than the average when you put it kind of an apples to apples basis. So that was one thing I wanted to kind of just point out is that I think um, people get have the perception that Vermont premiums are higher, but they actually, I think when we did the analysis, were actually a little bit slightly lower um, than the other states that we looked at um, when you normalize for age and just the, the fact that it's community rated. Um, and then to Darren's point, you know, even if you have a healthier older population, you know, old, the older you go, obviously you get you use more services. And so you are more likely to hit your deductible and your maximum out of pocket and use services more. So again, the, the federal AV calculator is, you know, set to a standard population, um, but when it comes to pricing, that could drive things a little bit um, be, to be a little bit more impactful than you would see in the federal AV calculator. Uh, this is Dana. This makes me think of another question is for um, Darren and Julie. Is the unit cost 8.8% and 5% based on the population up to age 64? since that coincides with QHP, or is it all of the population data? It'd be QHP. Okay, that's what I, that's what I thought. So it doesn't yeah. include the oldest cohort. Yeah, this is directly from the URTs from the, that the issuers filed for the ACA, uh, individual ACA. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and the one last thing is, you know, this, I, this isn't separated for medical versus drug and you know both on the medical and drug side there have been a lot of new like uh, you know Darren mentioned inflation so that's one big thing but there's also been a lot of new technologies and new drugs that are driving some costs higher as well so um you know so there there's been some some things lately that have definitely driven unit costs higher than what we've seen um, sometimes historically do you have national comparisons on unit cost not off the top of our head, but we could pull it and send out once we do. And then the other thing with the comparison between Vermont and other states, I, I believe there's what something like 10 or 10 or 15 or 12 or 13 or something other states that have community rating. Are there um, relevant comparisons between Vermont and those states? I think it's just you and Massachusetts. 
protocol that do community or or, or, what, or does New York still do community? There's only a couple I think on the fifth that might do it. Um, we could we could do a check um, on that, but let me know if the others think of others. But I'm not aware of others outside of Massachusetts and maybe New York. Thanks. Any other board member questions or comments? <clears throat> um, I, I move, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to approve the 2025 uh, qualified health plan designs as presented by the Department of Vermont Health Access, including the proposed out-of-pocket maximum amounts. I'll second. Any board member discussion on the motion? Any comment or question from the healthcare advocate? Uh, sure. Just this, as Darren mentioned, uh, it was a very strange year and a lot of rather difficult decisions to make. Um, our office uh, fully supports um, adopting this. I think just the point of this is, I suppose, slightly different. And I just wanted to clarify I mean, the amount of reduction to deductibles and cost sharing that you get through the CSR program, right, it varies by income level. So, you know, the 250 to 300 range, you, depending on who you talk to, I mean, from my view, it's a negligible reduction um, to cost sharing. Obviously, I think it's so wonderful that we have a state program, but it is worth thinking about it also assume you have to assume to get CSR you have to buy a silver plan so in addition to varying you could have some people who could qualify for a higher AV value plan but then make the wrong decision and actually say they could get a gold plan AV value if they purchase a silver plan but they buy a gold plan themselves, so they don't get the CSR, but they're paying more premium. Um, so looking at the distribution of CSR eligibility versus the choices of plans would make sense. It's something the board hasn't really looked at in the past, to my knowledge. Um, and then lastly, turning to, um, you know, premiums, I think this would be a somewhat more advantageous idea than silver loading would is to not allow um, non-standard plans on the marketplace. And so that would push up uh, PTC because the benchmark would be higher. It would also have the advantage, which silver loading doesn't have, um, that it reduces consumer confusion um, about healthcare options. I think it's similar to what California does. I do want to acknowledge that, um, you know, small group, small group market and members aren't eligible for PTC. So you'd have to balance the benefit to individuals versus the harm um, to the small group market. I think. You know, within that um, evaluation, you would want to think about who is the most vulnerable. Um, you would also want to take into consideration the fact that we did unmerge the market. So that benefit to small group uh, in reduced premiums might need to be taken account of. Um, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, is there any public comment? And if so, please use the raise your hand function. Whoop. I will note for the Whoop. record a, a clap from Mr. Carpenter. Walter, do you have a, a comment? Clap for, uh, a clap first and then um, 
backing up Tom and what Eric said, and, and Tom pretty much said what I was going to say, that overall, when I look at the plans, the premiums, the deductibles, the cost sharing, and all the rest of it, I think of the absolute cruelty of our market-based system and its utter failure um, because there's not a single Vermonter that can afford a $9,000 deductible unless they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Most of us labor for 20 bucks an hour, 25 bucks an hour. And as someone who just got kicked off, who, joined, who has just joined the 30,000 or so Vermonters who has been kicked off of Medicaid, my costs now have gone up over $4,000 a year. And if I lived in a country like Denmark or Norway or Taiwan, whatever, pick one, none of this would have happened. So as much as we try to dress these plans up, they're utter failures. Thank you, Walter, for your comment, and it's good to see you. Um, any other public I comment? I missed you, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> I missed you too. It's nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, I'm here. I'm not hiding anywhere. Uh, any other public comment? Okay, great. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Um, the motion is approved unanimously. And thank you, um, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Houlihan, for your work with us the last couple of weeks on this. Thank you all very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good have a good day. Thank you. Awesome. Um, that's the only uh, substantive agenda item. Is there any old or new business for the board today? And a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And we are adjourned. Thank you. Have a good day.